my Bank of Saipan just they finally started offering debit cards. Well, hot so dang. Today when I went into the bank, they, I was like, this is incredible. <laughs> debit cards, how novel. This technology. <laughs> they, I walked in and I was like, I was tipped off to it because I walked into Bank of Saipan today and um, to do stuff with my account. And I looked and I saw a sign that said ATM with the with the arrow pointing to it. And I was like, they got an eight. And I looked and I was like, they got an ATM. Wow. Incredible. Good for you guys. <laughs> pretty soon I'll pretty soon I'll show you guys Nirvana. Welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and tonight I'm here to ask Cyprian and Father, what was the most fun job you worked um, ever? You know, could be the one you're working now, or it could be one that you were when you were younger. I think I've asked about what was your first job, or maybe what was your worst job, but what was the job you actually enjoyed? Like, yeah. Yeah, the first one that maybe you're like, hey, this is not so bad. I'm actually kind of into this. Well, you know, as people may or may not know, uh, I was a tattoo artist for over 20 years. So, and then after that, I became a priest. So I haven't worked a day, you know, in like a couple of <laughs> decades, if that means anything. So aside from that, you know, when I worked, at various record stores. I worked for Warehouse and I worked for Virgin. Those were pretty fun jobs. Like they were definitely jobs, not, not, uh, you know, not a career. And I think that they're definitely jobs, but they were, they were fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, Cyprian? I would say, uh, so for years, while I was DJing and promoting at night and doing kind of the music thing, uh, during the day, I worked as a motorcycle courier in L.A. Oh. So basically. Uh, what kind of bike did you have? I had, well, dude, I had tons of bikes during that time because you blow through them, right? Yeah. So so we would just get like rat bikes, basically. Oh, yeah. um, but usually I had something between a, like, always between like 500 and 750 cc Mm -hmm. um, because they were light enough to like split lanes really well. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite bike uh, through all of those, I, I ended up with the Honda VFs a lot, like VF 700 and VF 750. I really liked, I, I liked that bike a lot for that job. Uh, various different years, the Interceptor. But um, what was interesting about that job, like in terms of it being a fun job, I mean, one, you're riding a motorcycle around LA all day like which is awesome but then there's there was also a at, the, at that time so basically what your job as a motorcycle courier is anybody who knows la is knows that the traffic is terrible mm -hmm. but the law there's a weird law that there's that lane sharing is allowed so you can actually split lanes in a motorcycle so anybody who's ridden around in southern california in traffic knows that motorcycles will split lanes and so there's two different things. One is, and this is what I started with, was driving basically like tapes and reels and things between the studio, the various different studios, editing houses and studios and stuff like that around town. That was cool, but I very quickly, it was a lot of work and not a lot of pay. And then I met somebody who was working. He, he had almost the same bike as me, and he was like, oh, you should, you should start working at, for the, the attorney services. And basically your whole job with the attorney services was – Century City. So for people who don't know, there's this this area of L.A. right by Beverly Hills called Century City. It's where all the attorneys are. It's like this high rise. If you look at L.A., you see this high rise section, not quite all the way to, to West L.A. or Santa Monica. And it's like I think it's like seven or eight miles on the freeway from downtown. So that's where everything needs to get filed at the courts. But all the attorneys are over here. 
and the courts close at a certain time, right? So the idea would be in the middle of traffic, rush hour, basically your whole job was you're going to load up and you're going to shoot down to the courts on these super high rush, very, they end up paying a bunch for the courier and guys died. Wow. Like it was crazy. Like every year there'd be one or two guys who died doing this job every single year. But the, the fun part, the fun part about it, the, the most enjoyable was the community of couriers. And they all hung out in Century City. There was a couple different spots where they hung out, but Century City was the main one. And the characters, they're from all over the place. A lot of Brits, a lot of Euros, because it's big in Britain. And a lot of like um, like uh, uh, outlaw bikers, actually. Mm. Like the, the president of the Devil's Disciples, like mm-hmm. the national president of the Devil's Disciples worked as a uh, as a motorcycle courier during the day, John uh-huh. Chillingsworth. Wow. And it was like being able to just sit around and hear the stories from these guys. I was young. I was in my 20s. That right there was like incredible. And it, and I mean, everybody's like a warrior. They're in leather jackets, <laughs> zooming around, and like the 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 risk of death is there for for a guy my age, and just to work that short amount of time, be outside in the sun, you know, girls and everything. Oh, it was yeah. so yeah. yeah. I could I, I mean I couldn't imagine having done it longer than I did it. it was so dangerous, so dangerous. And I would ride around with my bike half falling apart. I just ride it to the wheels fell off and then just buy a new one. It's crazy. I don't know. I, it's wild. Anyway, yeah, that was a long one. I hadn't talked oh. about the motorcycle career stuff in a long time. That's it's cool. like you went away. You disappeared. It was like <laughs> California sun was behind you. And... <laughs> I was feeling it, man. I was like, oh, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, I remember those days. What about you, Andrew? Well, <clears throat> mine's not nearly as interesting, but I worked at a car wash for a while and when I was like, in my late teens, early twenties. And it was just the first job that I didn't have to go in at night. Cause I really, really don't like that feeling. In fact, sometimes that's one of the things, the struggles I have with Vespers is this whole idea of waiting around to do something. I don't like that feeling at all. So like if I have to work at four 30 and, and in the evening, and then at like at two, I start being like, okay, well, what do I do until then? You know, I don't really want to just sit and like, do nothing, but I don't really can't get too heavily involved in anything. So I had to be there at like eight or 10 in the morning, every morning. And then we'd be out by six and we were outside all day. Mm-hmm. It was not really that challenging. And it was just, it was right before things went really, really dark. Um, it was like right before my brother died. And I was like, I had like a good group of friends. My alcoholism was kind of in check at the time. Like I was partying. But um, I was it wasn't like the I didn't have that like dark tint that it did later on mm. where I was like drinking to live or whatever. It was still like pretty fun. And like, everyone was hopped up. Everyone was all goofed up on something. So we all would just kind of go do whatever and we'd share. And it was just a lot, a lot of fun. And I remember like never really dreading. That was like the first time I never really dreaded going into work. Um, it was pretty chill. Like, um, and I got a bunch of my friends hired there. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but then, yeah, it all went bad eventually. And then I, you know, then it was, and then only that, but that was also like, if it was raining, you would, you're supposed to call before you went because there's a chance you didn't have to work and stuff like that. And then eventually I became like a, um, I forget what it was, but it was like a car, like a car wash salesman. So like I made commission on like the higher, the more expensive the wash. And so that was like the first time I got like an $800 check or something like that was from that job. So, um, and oh, wait, I, they get paid, they, they get paid more at car washes. If they upsell you, the individual guy gets paid more. Th- this, this particular place did. I don't know that's if that's a, like, that. A, that's a good incentive that they offered. Yeah. The problem with it is, is, is that the one wash that everybody wanted, you basically lose money on. So you really have to really work. But a lot of times these fleet vehicles would come in for these companies and be like 20 of that lowest wash in a row. Uh, And it's all like on averages. So it brings your whole paycheck down. So every time you're on like a streak of like getting bad, bad, bad sales, bad sales, bad sales, but it's like so demoralizing. Um, and it's just, it's just not fun, whatever. But, um, 
yeah that was like the first time that i'd ever got like a check over like three or four hundred dollars and i was also living in a situation where i only had to pay like a hundred dollars rent and even that was like partly covered by like my schooling and stuff like that so i was i was having a ton of fun it was like i had reconnected with my two oldest daughters because i was like in like the first stable housing place i'd been at in a long time so things were really good there for a little while probably for about six to nine months it was like a really really good time and it was one of those like breath of fresh airs like coming up for a minute and then mm. then then went right back down because then i think my brother passed away in 2000 march of 2011 and i think from probably like the summer of 2010 to the summer of 2000 or the that march was that time i'm talking about so it was pretty fun like i had a good time but um what? I'm sure we're going to get a lot of comments of people saying what their like most fun job was. What do you guys wager the percentage is that involve working outdoors? I just have this feeling like so many people will be like, yeah, my most fun job I ever did. And it's going to be working at something working outdoors. I think there's something to that. I think so too. I absolutely, I, th I was actually just thinking about this today, Cyprian, because it's nice here in Kansas city. It was like 65. Mm -hmm. and i had to actually have the door to my office open because my office is in a building by itself so i could have the door open and i it it never ceases to amaze me that's like a whole other dimension is added to your reality when the weather is nice because when you're when you're stuck going from room to car to room to room mm -hmm. to car to room to car for like a couple months it really starts to like you start to feel a little bit like um, I'm gonna say you're like like a a terraformer on a on a hostile planet or something like yes. that because you're just like going from sheltered environment to sheltered environment to sheltered environment, and when you can actually walk outside and not have to wear a coat or be immediately frigid, it just adds this whole other thing to reality of oh, I just go outside. This is incredible. Like mm -hmm. I think there's something to that without a doubt. 365 bro i'm outside right now yeah. <laughs> i'm on my deck right now <laughs> father yeah. knows the way see people would think like tropical paradise and they're like oh it's gonna be so humid it's gonna be dude it's crazy no i have I'm so spoiled i'm so spoiled i have no doubt it's probably the most idyllic like, weather you can ask for but i think in the guinness book of world records it actually is listed as that but here's my thing okay is is i and I'm just a child of the South, the Southern Midwest, but I do genuinely need seasons because I, I, with like the coming of spring, there's just so many memories associated with like when spring starts to come. And like, I even find myself like changing music. Like I listen to music when summer's starting, then like, like I just started like really rocking some stuff like a couple of weeks ago when it was started to get nice out. And I was like, and my brain was just getting flooded with all these memories of like my association with this band in this particular time of year. And so, yeah, idyllic weather, maybe I'm just trying to justify being jealous, whatever. But like, <laughs> I I can, I can honestly say that like when weather starts to change, it, it, I like, I get this like buzz for like a week where I get all this energy and I'm just like super, super excited and super good mood and stuff like that. So I, There's I don't something know with time. It's it like, and maybe this will get us into the topic today. And this is something that we were actually talking about on Sunday. I was talking about with the brothers here that, um, were it not for keeping the Orthodox calendar, I think the perception of time because the weather never changes here, Real, like significantly it does something to you and the people who have lived here for a while especially if they're not from here but they've lived here maybe like 10 years they'll talk about how like you just like look up and like five years has passed because there's nothing to like mark yeah. there's nothing to mark the time it's always the same right but it's like we were just talking about this because we were talking about this in uh in relation to like the fast and i was like oh having this fast free week I was like, oh, it went so, f it like it went so fast. Pun, in no pun intended. But it was like it went so fast because like Wednesday and Friday not being there to sort of mark mm. this change, this like notable change, right? And this brought me to thinking about. I was thinking about this earlier. 
and I know that this is going to get us into our topic because we're talking about Saint Nasitas and, and delusion, but um, I was thinking about how, uh, like, just the idea of like prophetic, the prophetic words from elders and how they turn into, they wind up being these very literal predictions. But when the elders say them, they are almost speaking in the present or the past. To make it like, is it making sense what I'm saying there? That like the time, uh oh, no, no, are you guys no. there? We're we're still here. We're just okay. Very stoic is people. Father there? Yes, yeah, Father, you're still there. Okay, yeah. I'm here. <laughs> I was thinking. I was thinking, <laughs> like even even the idea that like Revelation is is written in the the past tense, that it isn't like so often there's the there's this this feeling of a i don't even know i don't even know how to express this or 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 why it came in but like i'm just noticing that that you know as we're talking about all of the things that are happening as of late that it just seems like whenever there's these prophetic words like i'm thinking father seraphim rose right he's he's talking about like in orthodoxy and the religion of the future it's very much in the present tense mm -hmm. Like, it's very much that he's saying there is this movement that is happening now, he's saying. Mm -hmm. But it's like, we're starting to see it, and we read those words, and it's like, oh, he could have written this today. Mm -hmm. And there's this, we like, so, I, Father, that's what I, I wanted to, and I, I, and that's like the reverse of delusion, right? That it's like, that, that notion of time, you, I, I think, in my catechism, you made a mention of like liturgical time, this idea mm -hmm. that it's just like it's in the now. Mm -hmm. And I was I was hoping that maybe we could talk about that because a lot of people are bringing up, especially with all the things happening with the things in the air, the UFOs and all sure. of this. Everybody's bringing up, obviously, Father Seraphim Rose. Sure. But all of his work is written in the present. Sure. Like this is happening now. Well, I, I think um, I think it's evidence of his sanctity because there's an apostolic um, there's an apostolic kind of like savor to his writings. Um, we can think about how in the scriptures, Paul's writing to the Thessalonians, um, Paul's writing, uh, excuse me, St. John is writing in his first epistle. I mean, you know, even now the Antichrist is here, you know, even now they, that was the epistle for today, right? Um, and all of that is because those who are in the spirit are in the spirit and the spirit. Um, if you're in the spirit, you're, you're in the now. What we mean the now is like the totality of everything. It's dynamic. Um, it encompasses everything, <laughs> you know, encompasses past, future, present, and, and it does it in a way that is transcendent of the linear. And I think, um, you know, that's one of the things about delusion is that it's incredibly static. You know, when someone's in delusion, um, they're fixed in a certain perspective and a certain, um, and that perspective is is total. You know, that's, that's why it's deluded because they see that their perspective, their context of how they're seeing something wrong or right is the complete and the, the, the kind of totality of, of whatever situation. And so they lose that dynamic aspect. And those of, though when you're in Christ, you know, you have this, uh, you partake in his energy and you partake in his life and his life is, you know, dynamic. And that's the thing about Christ, you know, Christ being the ultimate liminal being human and man, you know, both God and man. And also, you know, his, his, <laughs> his faces are the faces of time. You know what I mean? The, the three faces, you know, the past, the present, the future, you know, there's that Trinity that's represented there, you know? So it's, you're able to, um, the ancient days, you know, and he is the one um, who is yet to come. You know, he's, he's both at the same time. And these paradoxes are kind of, if, if you can get behind what I'm saying, once you begin to understand these paradoxes and learn to live in them, these kind of become your boom tube. These kind of become your, um, your warp drive. This is, I don't know what they were, I can't remember what they were called in, in Dune, you know, with the spice, you know, and the kind of the, bending um with the um the engineers you know this is this is the way that you travel eons and ages and you travel forwards and backwards is in the spirit 
because a prophetic utterance from an elder is absolutely fresh and for the person who's hearing it. And it's absolutely fresh for the person in 50 years. It's both. Yes. How you know, it's from, it's from God is that, you know, you look at, there's other religions that have and traditions that have prophetic quote unquote utterances, but they're the utterances of men or of demons. Mm -hmm. But the utterance, the prophetic, a true prophetic utterance, which speaks of God has that eternal characteristic, which is paradoxical and dynamic and eternal. And it, it and it, it is. Was, I'm sorry, Father. I was reading the life of St. Nicetus and um, I had never caught this before that, um, the only thing he was, the only things he was prophesying were bad Old things. Testament. Yes. And bad things. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So things that the demons would know about, mm -hmm. like this crime's going to happen on this day. This thing's going to happen. You're going to lose this thing, blah, blah, blah. And that was like, um, man, I had never caught that before. It was just like, well, duh. Um, you know, and we've talked out that before, but the different quote unquote prophets that have arisen supposedly in like the, the MAGA camp about the great and glorious, you know, golden road that Donald Trump will lead us on, you know, so. Trust the plan, Andrew. Trust, trust the, plan. the plan. Trust the plan. Um, yeah. Well, there's a, the, I, I mean, the, this idea of prophesying something bad happening that you are going to make, that's like the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it has the, it has this, it's this self this has the self, potential. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's not a. I, I think Father, also, you know, before Orthodoxy, I would look at this sort of what you've said, and I I think that my sort of New Agey, whatever you would want to call it, esoteric brain would would go to an idea of cycles, and I used to think in terms of cycles, like mm -hmm. I. I and, and I still think that there's some True. potential validity in some of that, that there is cycles. But I feel like there's something that maybe cycles is a way of describing something that feels a little bit different in the context of like the prophetic prophetic utterance of an elder. Like it doesn't feel like it's a cycle, like it happened and then it's going to happen again and then it's mm -hmm. going to happen again per se, mm -hmm. but almost like it's in it's in action now in the same mm -hmm. way that it's in action in the future in the same way that it was in action in the past but that makes sense yeah i guess i guess maybe it's like trying to describe it it feels cyclical but i don't really have the right kind of definition for it right now because it's not as cyclical as we would understand it it's um it's overlapping and it's interpenetrating and well isn't it i think you've explained it to me before maybe i'm wrong father it's like it's like waves. So it like goes out. And so we like cover the same territory and then go back in and then it goes back out. And eventually like when all is done and done, it's like when it reaches its fullness. So like, we'll like, maybe, I don't know. I thought you'd no, explain no, that's to me. Good. Like that's good. I mean, cause that's, that is, it's a cycle insofar as this, um, it's not a cycle in the sense of how, like, when people talk about, like, oh, the Kali Yuga, and then, like, that will, you know, it's an age and eon destruction, and then, like, it'll happen again, you know, uh, in almost in the same way, but just kind of different players or something like that. It's not like that. It's we, we understand, we experience the cycle. The best way to explain it is um, childbirth. There's the cycle of contractions, right? Contraction, mm. contraction, and then it builds up until the child is here, you know, a, a, a new life is here. And so there are these contractions. These are the birth pains that our Lord talked about that are happening. Mm. And the problem is, is that again, you know, it says in the scriptures, um, you know, a day into the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as into a day. And so, you know, and, you know, he, <laughs> um, his return is, is not, you know, uh, slack as some in count slack it's it's not it's not the same thing so we can look at certain events and that and i think this is one of the many strong points of, of orthodoxy is that there is a proper accounting of history um and you know part of the problem that people need to get over is is they want to um project 
and um, artificially um, fasten on a kind of critical lens, an academic historical lens. And we don't read history um, the way that academics would read history. We don't. And so for a lot of people who've come to orthodoxy, they got introduced to history. And I mean, that's the lens that most of us have. Even if you weren't, quote unquote, an academic, most people um, have been raised in, in, in a context that their education to look at history in an inappropriate way. Um, and then when you become orthodox, you have to begin to look at it um, from you know a Christian, an orthodox perspective, which is not exactly the same. It's, it's pretty different actually. And it has for, more- for, to... Forgive me, Father. When we talk about the inappropriate way or the way that we see it, is this like the sort of like the Wikipedia entry where it's like the name and the date and the guy, and then kind of like the little story with the name, like what what is what is the difference between the two? Yeah, so I mean, obviously the first one is that they they divorce history from God, right? And so inherently people have a secularized view of it. They don't even realize it sometimes. You know, I, I mean, um, I've had conversations with brothers before where I, you know, kind of chimed in as best I could and said, you know, it's not it's not wise to say like I like history. I'm going to talk about history here. I'm a Christian, but I'm going to talk about history over here um, on their playing field and act like God doesn't exist, right? Um, and the problem with that is that, number one, you're already, your presupposition is problematic once you do that. And it becomes even doubly problematic when you are a Christian and then you play that game. Yes. Because you're you're opening yourself up to confusion, Um and the other problem with there, I mean, there's there's many of them, but another problem there is that um, that paradigm and that perspective treats history kind of like from an evolutionary lens. Like there's no purpose. There's everything's just random yeah. events that kind of happen. And we can try to string something together, but ultimately you're just projecting your own perspective on these events and treating them almost they like they're um kind of like objective in of themselves and that's that's not proper you know that that's not reality um and so what happens is, is that people will take history from that perspective and they actually begin to distort history and let me give you an example we're seeing that now we've been seeing it with you know this um I mean, I, I'm going to use the, the trigger word, but um, with this uh, neo-Marxist approach, which is, of course, coming from the academies, um, but this neo-Marxist approach to history, you know, and retrofit, retrofitting um, the events to, to fit a certain dialectic narrative. Um, okay. it's, I, I'm going to need you to break that down just a little bit. So neo-Marxist, what's going on there? What are we talking about? So I want to use the word neo-Marxist. The wokes, the wokes. The wokes, essentially. Sure, sure. Um, um, but even but what's interesting is that even I think, I think there's people who wouldn't find themselves in the woke camp, but they don't realize they even have that perspective and how they approach history, because you can find people who are you know very much right wing that kind of do the same thing actually. It's yeah, that, I call them I call them the wokes with the Q. The I do W O capital Q. The quotes. No, the no quotes. W O capital Q. Right. Yeah, that's oh. the land. Wokes. That's gotcha. man. That's yeah. man. Hashtag that. that. That's really good. The wokes. Oh wow. Yeah, that's good. So yeah, the wokes with you know the other ones. They're they're guilty of it in in a very similar way, um, but they're just fitting their kind of political narrative, you know. Um, and so for us, you know, we look at that, and we go, it's, it's problematic, right? Because again, you know, old hat, you know, we talk about all the time, but ideology is idolatry and it's taking a certain facet of something and making it the whole thing, yeah. whichever way you want to do it. Right. And so the proper way, you know, as an Orthodox Christian, we see history first and foremost with the presupposition that God is. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you do that, not only does it, you know, quote unquote, become this incredibly, like all the chaos is becomes this mosaic. I, I look at it this way, um, if this makes sense. Outside of the faith, 
and and I mean outside of the Orthodox tradition, you know, what you get a lot of times is, you know, throwing up this kind of box full of mosaic tiles and then kind of like staring at it like you would stare at the clouds and be like, oh, I think I see a face. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think I see a camel eating an ice cream cone. And, and there's the delusion. Times, there's the delusion that sets it, there's in. There's the yeah. delusion. And a lot of times it's so nonsensical, but it it has reference to like things that really don't connect, but you can make them connect in your deluded, you know, fantasy, the mm -hmm. delusion. And then that's how people interpret history, you know, whether they're wokes or whether they're the wokes. But we don't do that. What we do is we actually, when you have that presupposition and then you follow, you know, you follow the guides, what happens is the mosaic actually is this incredibly coherent. The glass becomes an actually incredibly coherent mosaic. Now, someone would say, okay, but that's just you doing the same thing, but in a different way. And I would say, yes, except for one thing, um, you can actually, in, like you woke or wokes, whatever, you can actually be, you can actually enter in and see that mosaic coherently. You can, de you'll deny how it got made. You'll do all those things, but they can see it. And and that, that's, that's the difference, right? Like there isn't anyone, I was, forgive me. Um, this is going to seem like a non sequitur, but I just want to give an example, you know? Um, it's very much like you can take a community and you know, why is it that one community can like see their errors and just kind of like admit it, but another one can't? It's this delusional piece, right? It's just like, it's it's a delusion and an un, it's an unwillingness that ends up leading you into delusion. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does. Father, Father, is it because we have, I mean, I know it's because we have Christ, but I mean, at a like, at a pragmatic level, one of the things that I'm saying as you describe this mosaic and you describe this story and what I see missing from the delusion is the eschaton. Mm -hmm. Like an arrow and an end. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and again, when we use the term, like when we talk about cycles in this proper sense, right? So nature gives us the referent. Nature gives us the exact, because God created all these things, right? All these processes, right? Um, there is a, a result of it. It isn't a cycle for the sake of a cycle, if that, if that makes sense. There, there has to be some result to it. And it points to something that God is revealing about himself and about the nature of, of his creation, which includes us, right? That's the point. And that's ultimately like gets you to the eschaton. And this is a key thing because when we say like eschaton and the end and the parousia and these things, it's like, we're not talking about abstract concepts. St. Simon, the new theologian, right? He says, essentially, like, if you don't have these four tastes of the kingdom to come, you should, you, you know, you really should question your salvation. I'm saying that because when you get these tastes, you don't really care about, you know, the wokes with the Q or the normal wokes because you've, you've, you've tasted that future life and you go like, oh, you get it. That's why when you talk with someone who's in Christ or you talk with a spiritual father or, or you know, someone who has you know, some measure of grace, it's like outside of that, people just can be baffled by the clarity, 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 clarity. Um, and that comes from, you know, I guess one way to put it is here's the mosaic, right? If you're putting the mosaic together, what's the referent? Like the elder, the person who who's not in delusion, they have the original that you are referencing to mm -hmm. make the mosaic and they can see it, right? There is no kind of guessing. That's why, that's why you can feel the difference between, for instance, you know, quote unquote theologians. Like, you know, we've all heard this before, but in our tradition, a theologian is one who prays, not one who studies, you know, per se, academically. And that's why you can tell, even with like, when you read, an, when you read a quote unquote orthodox theologian, quote unquote, you can feel the difference. Like, okay, yeah, they're orthodox, but you 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 start getting a sense of like, there's this speculative nature to yeah. it. And yeah. He doesn't, 
there isn't the clarity. Like you can tell that they're kind of like flying blind on some things. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? They may be doing better than the Protestant guy who's just doing whatever, but there's still that nature to it, which is very much like that kind of Western scholastic influence, which has to do with the intellect, the light of the person and the light of whatever they're chasing, whether it's, you know, a tenure or having someone recognize them mm -hmm. or feeling like, I'm fulfilling this mission of building the bridge with the West, whatever that thing is that isn't Christ, that's, that's their referent and you can feel it. Whereas someone who's squarely in the life of the church, repentance, right? Seeking Christ. There's a clarity there that is just consistent all the time in spite of their failings. See that that's another thing that, how is it that like you, when you when you're around someone who's holy or even not even holy just someone who has grace or someone who's who's got the reference someone who's seen the rabbit someone who has the icon of christ or looking at it actively it's not like they're perfect but they kind of are if that makes sense it's like the <laughs> the clarity they, they, they seem forgive me father because because those individuals seem to what you're hearing is not them correct yeah correct yeah. Like, they, like they, they, they are flawed, through, but you don't hear them. <laughs> exactly. And when, and like when things about them do pop through, like, oh, he's got a really nasty mole on his chin or, ooh, his breath is kind of what, you know what I mean? Those things, they really begin to fade away because, because you're just enamored and you're amazed by the clarity of what they're saying. Now, the problem becomes problem becomes is that people oftentimes lose sight of that so what you'll get is and you get this unfortunately i think it's a phenomenon especially now you know familiarity breeds contempt yeah and so familiarity is another kind of delusion it's a type of delusion someone thinks that they know someone they, they reap the benefits of being with the person they reap the benefits of you know getting the instruction, the guidance of someone, whatever it is, the care for them, and they become complacent. Mm -hmm. And then what begins to happen is they become intoxicated by the benefits of what they've reaped. And, and this is where people, you know, they lose sight of their repentance, they lose sight of humility of actually who they are. And they start getting deluded, prelist, and they start thinking that they're further advanced than they really are. And so what begins to happen is they become slowly deluded. And it starts off with, you know, uh, father's good, but, you know, he kind of like doesn't really get this. Father's good, but he, you know, or, you know, so-and-so, my godfather, my godmother, you know what I mean? There's, there, it it starts slow. Abba Dorotheus, uh, St. Saint Dorotheus of, of Gaza, he has this great account where he talks about this deluded monk who, you know, at first is kind of like, yeah. You know who, who's who's Abba Cisos? and then he came back and talked to this deluded monk. He's like, "Yeah, who's Saint Basil? Who's who's John Chrysostom? Like, who are they? You know what I mean?" Then he comes back. And he's like, "Yeah, who are the apostles? Like, really? Like, like why? Are, you know, who are it's they?" Like, oh, you're getting real close. Yep. You're about and to then, get real close. Yep. And then finally, he got to this point. He's like, ah, who's the Holy Trinity? You know, and it's it's just it's shocking, but that's that's what delusion does, and and delusion is fundamentally like there's certain things that are, I mean, every all, all sin, all deception, it all comes from the evil one, but there's certain things that are really, um, really like it, it's it's a deep vein when you tap it. So rebellion is one, and rebellion is a kind of is a type of delusion, right? Um, and then just straight delusion is, is like so satanic. It's so Luciferian because that that was, you know, he fell. His pride is delusion. And that's the thing the fathers talk about, you know, pride is like a fever. And one of the hallmarks of pride is delusion. It is. You, you, you know, it's like I was telling the kids this morning, um, you know, if you know everything, you can't learn anything. Yeah. Right. And so this is what happens to people. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, I'm, this is just me speculating, right? Um, but I think that, you know, there's movements and like the Yerodivi, the Holy Fools, 
you know, are, are a particular phenomena. Um, but I, I think they're a particular phenomena because they were needed to kind of start speaking to the coming delusion of modernity um, and the kind of delusion that comes from people who, you know, that fair saying tendency to be like, I got it together. It's so strong. Um, and, and it's like sought after too. people strive for it. They really trust do. the science, trust the science. Yeah. yeah. And that, yeah, I just real quick. I, I don't, this is just going to be a side thing and we can go right back, but I, it's amazing. Like, because when father was talking about, um, God being obviously the thing that binds all of history together, everything. Okay. Right. Um, and then, uh, it's amazing how it's so quickly evident how quickly this becomes. These are just physical manifestations of spiritual actions, you know, like, you know, to an extent. And I was looking at um, pictures and I forget what protest it was, but um, I think it was actually like an abortion protest or something. And there's all these, you know, hands off my body, you know, stuff like that. And then there's one sign that just stuck out. And of course, after talking with you guys, I realized that sign was placed there for a very specific reason it's like there's very much like something going on there and all the rest of the signs are black and this one was white and it said trust the science <clears throat> what does that have to do with abortion at all and it's like oh it's the spirit you know it's the spirit because you know th everyone's wearing a mask you know everyone's you know so it's this whole spirit and so this whole like i got this we've got this figured out like um you know we have we can just understand it um, and to, um, uh, I'll wrap with this, but like, there's this comedian I really, really like look into him. If you want to, you don't have to Sam Hyde. And he does this like two little two minute video. He's next level. He's absolutely brilliant. I love this guy to an extent, you know, he, he's, he's not an Orthodox Christian, so you can only trust him so far, but there's this like two minute video. Of, he's like playing a video game or something. And someone asks him like, what do you think of atheism? It's like, it's the most cringe thing I've ever heard in my entire life that your brain that can fit in a bucket can figure out everything, can just understand everything. He's like this watermelon sized thing. He's like, and he starts like, oh, you know, we figured out this one thing that the way the electrons interact with the atom, he's like, which, you know, that might, that might, those might exist. And he's still just like, yeah, those might exist. Who knows? But like, it was just like this excellent video, just like this summary of just being like, yeah, no, this is absolutely ridiculous. And then to take that into the, 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 the life that we're talking about, the Orthodox life and these people, whoever people they are saying, you know, like, oh, we've, we've got this, you know, we've kind of understand what's going on here. And I, I personally think it comes back to being uncomfortable versus comfortable. Like, I think if you are really okay with being like, I don't understand things, I don't have to understand what's happening here. I, I usually see God through the rear view mirror rather than in the present. Like I can understand only later what was happening. I think that's this whole modernity of like, no, we need to figure out what's happening now and what's going on and why it's happening and stuff like that. I think that like, um, I, well, I isn't part of the fundamental reality of being a Christian is like learning to trust and be present with the unknown. I mean, that that's another portion that more than just saying what delusion is, like what brings it on. And I think people's fear and the, you know, fear can really facilitate all kinds of things, you know, fear can facilitate pride, uh, fear can facilitate, you know, a type of delusion because the absolute, that feeling of needing to, needing absolute control um, is something that's really powerful in people, you know? So, um, I think that's what I was trying to get at, Father. And ex I'm going to ask you then. So what would be like the, maybe I'm not saying this right, but what's like the middle step from fear to this like needing to understand? Like, is there like a middle step between the two? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, does fear connect straight to this whole like needing to understand it? Or is it like, fear leads to needing to feel comfortable and needs to feeling needs like leads to like needing to feel in control. Like, I'm just trying to understand the process yeah. of how that goes yeah. down because yeah. it plays out in my life every day. Like yeah, it plays I mean, out on like the micro as it does the macro. So, yeah. I mean, you just said it right there. You know, it's like someone's 
fearful of something, usually fearful of being uncomfortable. Um, you know, this is why aestheticism is so important because you start learning how to not be comfortable 24-7. Um, and that absolute need to be comfortable or that absolute need to not be uncomfortable, I guess is a better way to put it, that leads someone to just have to be in control at all times. And it isn't just physical comforts, right? It's just having to be right. You mm. know, some people, um, some people are so sick that they can't just handle, they can't even handle the thought of having to be wrong. You know, some people are so sick that just the thought of them being wrong on something or the embarrassment of being wrong is so strong for them um, that they become just completely irrational, like a child, you know, but it becomes even worse. Sure. And, you know, um, that leads to this, you know, habitual behavior. And that, that's where the delusion starts to kind of kick in because um, that reality is so strong. You've allowed that reality to become so strong and you've refused any, you know, reality check that now um, you feel as if there's no other, you know, choice but to give into this. And, you know, this is where the kind of temper tantrum you know, it starts off throwing things, you know, when you're a child, but when someone's older, they may throw things still, but it ends up being more of a matter of like their will and just having to lock down on something. And um, it, it's tough. It's tough because, you know, we always talk about this, but we need to understand these things primarily, you know, on a, on a broader level, meaning it isn't just the individual, it's a social thing. It's, it's, it's our culture, you know, um, and it really only gets resolved from my, I mean, from my perspective, it only get, really gets resolved in the light of Christ because um, the world and the devil can give you a dose of truth, but that dose of truth often leads you to destruction. Um, whereas, you know, it, well, let me rephrase that, forgive me, let me walk that back. The, the devil in the world will give you honesty right? They'll be brutally honest and just like destroy you. But Christ will give you truth, which, you know, that truth, if you embrace it, always leads to healing. Whereas the honesty of the world and the devil doesn't, it's there to break you. You know, Christ can pick up the pieces for sure. And sometimes people need to be given over to Satan, like St. Paul said. There's times when it's like, you know what? It's better to give this person over to Satan you know, um, that the flesh be destroyed, but the soul might be saved. And we can understand that not just in the sense of, you know, the guy who's a habitual fornicator or habitual addict. And it's like, look, you've stolen from mom so many times. She lost her house because of you. Like, we can't do anything now. We've got to just not enable Billy anymore. Okay. We can understand that in that context for sure. But I think there's another way we can understand this, giving someone over to Satan, that their flesh would be destroyed, but their soul might be saved. Because the flesh isn't just this, you know? The flesh is also, as we say, like, what are the enemies of mankind? You know, the flesh, the devil, the world, right? So we talk about the flesh. What we're talking about is the, the natural carnal mind, right? Um, and its appetites and its proclivities. And so sometimes you need to give someone over to the devil that the flesh might be destroyed. So when we say that, we're talking about those proclivities, that hubris sometimes, that pride. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you got to let God work it out sometimes. And sometimes you can't bail your kid out. Sometimes you got to, you, it's the best thing to do is if they just are proud, 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 you know, um, let them take a lump, let them get a burn, you know, learn, learn the hard way, learn the hard way, metaphorically, yeah. right? Like, like yeah. spiritually, yeah. emotionally, you yeah. know what I mean? It's like, um, because I, because I would say this, if you don't, cause some, we, we don't do that because we're worried like, Oh, what if they hurt themselves or what if they have some kind of psychotic break or just whatever I would say to you, okay, okay, sure. I mean, we can be concerned about that, but at the same time, 
if you don't do it, I guarantee they're going to be lost. Yeah. I guarantee it. You know? I'm, I'm going to go yeah, back. Trade off. Yeah. I'm going to go back this episode and watch this because I'm pretty sure you will see have seen a beam of light just shoot into my head just like not but like a minute ago when we talked about the world will give you honesty or truth or whatever because that's give you honesty sure. and the crash will give you truth you know yes thank you father thank you um because that's yeah, that's how it's happening right now isn't it because everyone's mm-hmm. facing like the brutal honesty mm-hmm. of life like everyone's mm-hmm. facing like the brutal like yeah it is hard yeah like quote unquote the struggle is real like yeah, you do have problems. Yeah, your parents weren't great. Yeah, the economy's not great. Capitalism's not mm-hmm. great. Communism's not great. Whatever. All that stuff is true. Mm-hmm. Like, what now? Mm-hmm. It's like it's well, the serpent. It's the serpent. It's 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 the serpent. Uh, it's Genesis chapter three, man. I mean, it's not like the serpent. I mean, the serpent wasn't really lying per se. Mm-hmm. He, but he wasn't telling the fullness of the truth. Yeah. He's being honest. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah. he's being honest but he wasn't being truthful yeah i mean it's uh th- we and i think it breeds also this like there's this weird relationship with information that modernity has given us to where people get fearful and somehow we've been programmed that we can fix anything if we only had more information yeah. like if we could just get another peer-reviewed study if I could just get another chart, if sure. I could just get another graph, uh, if I could just have another poll, like we could figure it out. And it's like, well, the world doesn't really operate like that because most information is noise. Mm-hmm. Actually, those of us who deal in information for a living, like who are in information fields, know that like, no, no, no. Actually, the job is to reduce the amount of information. Mm. Like what you're really trying to do is you're trying to filter information. Like, don't give me more information. Give I mean, me signal. Forgive me, Cyprian, but that's great. That's how it is in the spiritual life. I mean, you know, not consistently, but I mean, I'll just, you know, I'll just say it. You know, like there's um, my daughters are super susceptible to this. You know, women are more susceptible to it than men, but men are not immune to it. But it's this thing of, um needing to understand something but that needing to understand is not in the proper context in the proper light it's it's it comes from this movement of like wanting control and we can get into like maybe it's like you know not having security blah blah blah. but ultimately what i'm getting at is it you i see it all the time where you know the spinning out begins to happen because it's like you know, the, that person's trying to shove more and more information. And a lot of it is to kind of like find that sure footing of justifying themselves, justifying what they're going through, how they're feeling. Right. And I need, I need data. I need data to build my case. You know what I mean? Um, Where's the paralegal, get the assistant, get them, get more. And it's like, as we're trying to cram more information in there to kind of validate themselves, you know, cause God, you know they don't like feeling comfortable with being wrong and and you know all these things that are happening all the while what needs to happen is the heart is is being starved out and the heart once it's like when someone's in that space of a temptation and they're just locked in and they just you know it's, it's just like you feel like the doubling down that we talked about you know it's like the only way out of that is the heart and what's funny is the heart is always looking to simplify, 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 because the words of Christ are simple. When the Lord speaks something, it's, it's not um, primitive. It's not, you know, it's elegant. It's simple, but simple. And it has that, it has that elegance to it. And it, it, it's eternal. It, 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 it has these layers. It, it's, it's in the now. And then you can also use it a million times over and it speaks to past it speaks to past experiences it's true right but when we are in that space of delusion we just can't hear that and the information actually is what clogs our noose our ability to to understand what's happening to us because essentially what's happening is you know the noose being the eye of the heart the faculty that truly understands then that can see accurately um the brain you know, and the rational mind is trying to take over, the ego is trying to take over, and it's like, 
blocking everything. It's just kind of like clouding it all out with this really superfluous information that just, you know, at best is making things more difficult. Um, well, at best it's obscuring something, but oftentimes it just ends up making things more and more difficult. And you begin to look more and more at that information in an idolatrous sense. So instead of having one idol, it's like, pop, 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 pop. it's just the whole room begins to like, the whole room of your mind begins to be populated with all these little idols of every little- Pantheon, you create a pantheon create for a pantheon. every little thing. Yeah. And yeah. it seems it seems father like that was the that was the pagan motion, right? Because they would cre start creating you get into that motion of paganism and they would create a god for every little thing. Well, the, every little about, thing they'd have yeah. a god. Well, just think about this too. Paganism isn't about salvation. <laughs> paganism is about getting what you want or being okay or being safe, not being afraid, getting getting the food, getting the woman, getting whatever the God will give you. Paganism has nothing to do with redemption. It has nothing to do with, you know, the human being being made into something pure. Paganism has nothing to do with purification, right? It has everything to do with, you know, idolatry and appetite. Scientism then is paganism. It's neo-paganism. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Ooh. Because, uh, yeah, because... I mean, scientism, scientism, sorcery, scientism, sorcery, yeah, you know what I mean? It's, it's sorcery, right? And I mean, again, like the pagans, you know, we can be charitable with, with pagans and we can get into like a kind of more specific thing about like pagans being kind of the ignorant folk, whatever, and just leaning into their backwards traditions. But I think that's actually what pagan means. Yeah, well, because pagan Pagani is like it means country. like a simple country country bumpkin, yep. basically like country. a bumpkin. Yeah, That's interesting, right. That's interesting. Right. So, what was like the counter to that in ancient pagan civilizations was that philosophy was like that the sophisticated pagans was like like oh if they're these superstitious backwards farm folk, then like was the philosophy like an well, answer no, to I mean, that? You have to, I mean, you have to understand that like pagan is really only understood in the light of christ sure sure everything else is yeah it's just one yeah they didn't gods. see themselves as pagan they yeah. didn't even see that there was anything other than well of course everybody's got lots of gods right. they didn't they like, didn't check a box the world. <laughs> they didn't go in and like check a box i am a pagan or whatever mm -hmm. they just speaking of which did you guys read that vice um article that um i linked in the group chat but that supposedly they've rediscovered this language oh, yes. of this long lost civilization called the Amorites. Mm -hmm. that they're just, you know, that they're just like coming and be like, Oh wait, there's a list of all of these Amorite gods. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start translating and figure out who these gods are. You know, I'm just saying, I wish someone would take care of the King of the Amorites. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but Yeah. But I mean, I thought it was pretty interesting. I think, especially in light of our conversation last week, where it was talking about the six fingers and stuff like. Because am I right, it's Father? All coming, it's all coming. Am back. I right about the Amorites, Father? That those were some of the the am the I uh, right about the Amorites. That's good. That's good. About they were Nephilim, right? Or at least involved in the Nephilim. The land, yeah, the land that was, you know, if I if I remember correctly, yeah. It's Ab is that Abraham? The Amorites? He fought the. Is that who Abraham? No. I Am thought I the Amorites wrong? surrounded Mount Sinai. Oh, that's right. Man, I could really be wrong about that. I think that's right. Hold on, I'm looking it up. Okay, all right. I'm looking it up. Hashtag pre-production. Yes. <laughs> For real. <laughs> For real. Hold on. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm just saying okay. it's like the Balrog, right? Because we're just keep digging and digging and digging. Eventually, mm. we're gonna find okay. something. Okay, they are. Island mountaineers who uh, inhabited the land of Canaan. Genesis 10, 16. Uh, descendants of Canaan, the son of Ham. Well, they weren't good. What were they known for? By yeah, the way. Known for their, known for their stat stature. They were giants. Mm -hmm. They were giants. Was they were as tall as cedar trees in, in Amos, we read. They were known for their evil ways, idol worship, and as enemies of the Israelites. 
But were they at Mount Sinai? Does it say anything about that? It's okay. Well, let's do I'm so sure someone... Genesis Genesis chapter 10, uh 16. We could just uh, go to scripture 10 16. Uh no this is just a this is a this is a king's list here okay it's um yeah i could be wrong someone correct me please hey you know what i that knew thing... i knew it was for i knew they were from Gen genesis that's, but... about. Oh. that's that's the whole thing about father talking about people are devastated to be wrong i don't care i might be wrong i could wholly be wrong about this i thought that they surrounded Moses's encampment or the encampment of the Israelites at Mount Sinai, but I could be completely wrong. Speaking of which, while I got the mic real quick, have you guys seen that that um Noah movie from 2014 with Russell Crowe? Yeah, yeah, I never saw it. Yeah, guess who's the good guys in that? The Watchers. Oh, really? Yeah, the Watchers are the good guys. They're the ones helping Noah defend against the line of Cain. Like, they're the ones that came and were like, we tried to do all we could to help you. We gave you fire. We gave well, you Well, I guess knowledge. that's interesting because isn't that kind of the narrative? Like, so there's this whole thing with, like, the UFO thing where it's, it's like, so weird to me because uh, I'm not really following it too closely, but it doesn't seem like anyone's really buying or biting the bait of it being aliens, you know? Oh no, nobody's biting. Nobody's biting. So, that. which is yeah, good, totally, totally. No one's, no and one's buying that at all. And I think more people are kind of seeing, you know, it's like a Reichstag, another Reichstag moment. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like. I think but everybody's just, paying attention to it, which is interesting. Just yeah. meant to distract like, so, from so Ohio. So it's almost yeah. So it's almost or not not just Ohio, you know, but of the Seymour Hirsch report. That the U.S. was the ones who blew up that that pipeline. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's nobody's oh. talking about that, and it's like, yo, <laughs> yeah. that's like a declaration of war against both Germany and Russia. By the way, yeah, hmm. it's crazy. It's so, crazy. so I and found again, out Amorites. I've got Amorites information here, okay. and um, you know, you may have just been uh, you may have just been channeling something because it's actually. It's not from scripture per se. It's from the Talmud, and it's pretty bad. Um, they are pretty bad. So, masters of witchcraft. Oh. So it, the Canaanites. Canaanites are usually spoken of as the Amorites in biblical literature. Uh, they were the characterized as the most intractable of all nations. Uh, to the apocryphal writers of first and second pre-Christian century, they are the main representatives of heathen superstition, loathed as idolaters, in whose ordinance Israelites may not walk. A special section of the Talmud is devoted to the various superstitions called the ways of the Amorites. According to the Book of Jubilees, the former terrible giants, the Rephaim, gave way to the Amorites, an evil and sinful people whose wickedness surpasses that of any other and whose life will be cut short on earth. Whose wickedness, whose wickedness mm. surpasses that of any other. Mm. Sounds like us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying. I'm saying. Sounds like us. <laughs> also yeah. interesting, descended from giants. Yeah, with, it's interesting because I, well, you know, I think we were talking about that before um, with. Um, with Baal and Asherah, you know, and, and these old gods, you know, and even uh, with the um, those old rites, those priestess rites of, you know, the um, the transgender priests, you know, um, and so it's just it's interesting because I guess this is this is I guess one of the ways we can look at a distinction because there is a cyclical nature to the way the demonic is working. And I just connecting that back to what I was saying about last week about how the demonic is fundamentally banal, you know, it's mm-hmm. like they re- they keep repeating the pattern, and and that's the that's the cycle that is not not for us to understand. Like we are looking at it in regards of the cycles of like childbirth, you know, and the the contraction leads to something new and it leads to life, whereas these cycles in the kind of new age and even the demonic sense are these sterile cycles where it's just a rehashing and rehashing, you know, to, to a greater degree. And so 
For, forgive me, Father. Is the is this, you know, the banality seems like a, a an. In, I've thought about it so much. What you said, and it's so right. Like, but it seems like it's this, it's this incredible constraint. And is that constraint there because they are out of the light of Christ? Like, so there's nothing new that can be revealed to them. Is that why they can't that be, they can't have revelation? So they can only just yeah, repeat? they're dead. I mean, they are they are. Uh. They are dead in your shadow. Is that why culture sucks now? Well, that's what I was thinking. Like, everything's a reboot. Right, because we have a culture of death. And so if you understand a culture Uh of death, right, it isn't just like, oh, abortion. It isn't just, oh, you know, like, there's no actual rehabilitation, repentance of prisoners, right? Just kill them, Mm -hmm. right? It, It isn't just kind of like, you know, we don't look to engage and seek to have perhaps even fruitful relationship with other nations let's just dominate them and destroy them right but it's it's death even in the sense of culture is no longer producing life it isn't producing new ideas it isn't producing you know things that are life-giving you know it's completely cut itself off from the energies of god so it's fundamentally bleak and banal and then you know it leads us to to a really boorish existence and um you see how I think this is this is again my perspective, but you see how it's so such a stark contrast to the life of Christ, because you know getting back to the elders, the prophetic utterance, it's like in Christ the elders are incredible. They prayer is a fundamentally creative act, and prayer when you, when you begin to you know um, enter into understanding what prayer is beyond the form of prayer. And how it's fundamentally, and, and it's insane how creative it is. It's the same reason why, you know, elders, they can take something. They can take a pair of glasses and make someone see. I mean, there's so much that they do. It's like they see the potential in everything to bring the light of Christ mm. to the pure. All things are pure. And so that's why there's no limitation on them. They're a law unto themselves. And that you see that and like, who can do that? Only Christ. Only Christ can bring about that creative beauty i mean that's why we worship that's why we stand in awe of him because when someone able when when an elder or a saint or someone who's holy is able to do these things to break what what seemingly seemed like boundaries you know even even and again like exactly, getting exactly. back to the euro like the euro it's like you know saint theophil of of the key of caves it's like what how is he a saint you know where are all these mm-hmm. things it's like that's christ it's like christ is you know, breaking and, and moving beyond those those boundaries, but not in the way it's not it is it isn't um it's not rebellion. It's not rebellion, it's not iconoclastic. It, what it is is it's it's always moving out, you know, it's yeah. expansion, right? Expansion and- as opposed to rebellion. Father, that's a big that right there is something wow, what a concept. That's so, so simplifies and like, so typifies. Uh Oh, did I lose you guys again? No, no. You're good. You're oh, good. See, I'm always, <laughs> no, just super I'm always today. scared. Just super Gosh. Stoic, yeah. Okay. Lent no, is coming. That, that, Lent yeah, is coming. that, that absolutely like for me, that simplifies, you know, because it's like, what's the answer to this rebellion? What's the answer to why does, why does this all feel why does like the woke rebellion, why does all of this, the stuff from the alphabet supers, like why does all of this feel so, so flat, so just stale, and it, stale and it's, poisonous. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's because it's falling in on itself mm-hmm. rather than saying, oh, we let's move beyond. We're constrained mm-hmm. here. We need to get revelation so that we can move beyond where we are. So they push the boundaries of hedonism. Is that what you're trying to say? No, it's it's that they're not pushing boundaries at all. They're like cannibalizing. They're Mm -hmm. eating. They're eating up the thing that they're standing. Because nothing that they're doing is new. It's not a new thing to have transgender. That's not new. The priest. The priests. uh, The priest. As opposed to Saint Theophilus. As I got you. Yeah, the priest of Asherah did that. I mean, there's there's nothing that the wokes there's nothing that what's happening is new you know like and even like getting it like the whole 
change from male to female. And I mean, we, we I think, I'm sure, I think we talked, I know we talked about the threat. I don't know if we This is about ancient. It. That's ancient. Yeah, yeah it's ancient. 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 And so, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing new about it. And it's funny because getting, you know, talked last week about the tell, but you know, it's like, I mean, even when like kids are talking about like every movie is just rehashing something. Well, it's like, yeah, because the culture is, is reflecting and tell the tell is showing who's actually driving culture or I should say what is driving culture. Sure. Um, and so the culture of Christ, which is incredible, is so fresh. You know, this gets into, um, you know, Nietzsche talking about um, Apollo and Dionysius, you know, and of course, you know, Nietzsche and it's like, oh, Dionysius is revelry and, 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 and you know, it has, you know, uh, Dionysius is dynamic and, and all these things. And actually, you know, Apollos is, is static and there's no life in Apollos. And of course, Nietzsche is talking about, you know, seeing Dionysius as a prototype or an archetype of the devil. And Apollo is an archetype of, of God. Um, but what's interesting is that it's profound that in, in the stability of God, there's, there's in, eternal and infinite uh, creativity and you know it's kind of like getting people to understand this you know um, repetition is the soil by which spontaneity is birthed yeah people get it so backwards and everyone wants to be like I don't want to learn scales exactly. I don't want to learn how musicians to, know if you anybody know, knows musician know. I don't want to learn compositions you know I just want to draw pick up and draw you know it's like here, here's here's a big thing, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I read this book. I went to whatever Bible college. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm Orthodox, and I can do whatever. And it's like, yeah, man, you, you don't even have the basics down. It's like, you don't. It, it really is like the cat who just thinks that he can get out there and whoop someone's butt because. You know, I've said this before, like, well, you watch a couple of YouTube videos and like you think you can do something, but it's like people overlook the reality that the discipline of structure, the discipline that that seedbed, I mean, spontaneity to some degree, not not completely, but to some degree is an illusion. Right. It's an illusion because when you see someone who's able to spontaneously do something, what they're what you're seeing is you're seeing the fruit sprouting of soil sure. a seed that's been in soil for a long time you know what i mean um and that spontaneity that you know the dionysian kind of embrace and the reverie it's a lie it's an illusion it's not it's not real it's false and in fact it leads to it leads to death because it it's it's a short just, lived bang it doesn't do anything and then you sit around all the time waiting for it yeah you like sit around you know, it's like the person chasing that first high, you know, it's like, you'll never find it. Um, um There's this book. <laughs> it's the subtle, the subtle art of not giving a, and then it's an expletive mm -hmm. that starts with F. Um, And I, it was a book I read in early recovery and it's nice. It has some okay sentiments in there. But um, one of them was that this dude was basically breaking down. Like he was grew up listening to like Pantera and Metallica and stuff like that. And he was so sure he wanted to be a musician and he was like so sure that he wanted that that's what he wanted to do. And then as he found a band and started writing music, he realized like, no, I don't want to be a musician. I want to be a rock star. Mm -hmm. And like, I want to get up on stage. I want people to worship me. I want people to know every single word, every single one of my songs and know every single solo, but I don't want to have to lug my equipment around for 10, 15 years before that. And I don't want to have to, go through bad shows and yeah, I mean, crash forgive me, you know kind of harken back to i mean that gets us a little bit back to the punk rock conversation too because that's something that definitely in the super negative it introduced into the water um like sid vicious as an archetype of like just the spectacle yeah and not really you know just There's exactly no meat, what man. you said you know and and it's it's funny to me because again I I think that we talked about this I guess like last week or whatever but um, it's the same thing with people just parroting 
the facts of the science that they pulled off the internet. Sure. Um, and that goes both ways. It isn't just about COVID stuff. It's about people who are just parroting stuff they read about orthodoxy. And it's like, I mean, yeah, oh, that's man, facts, but you but could like, tell that you could tell that father, yeah, like, forgive you me, but that's mean? just like, it's so like you say, there's no saver. There's no saver, you know? And so it's like going in and doing and doing the work, you know, and, and it's just, it's, 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 I guess, tragic um, because that's where you're actually going to find Christ. Like you can't find Christ in the information. You have to find Christ in the experience. In the incarnation. In the incarnation, in the incarnation. It's funny because St. Isaac the Syrian, um, he talks about, you know, there's two ways of, of knowledge, you know, there's, um, there's, there's experience and and then there's vigilance or 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 prayer, right? Noetic prayer, and it's funny because he says that noetic prayer is higher than experience, and I hear that go whoa whoa whoa. But here's the thing: it's still experience, because he's he's because people hear that they go like yeah yeah I can just read something and then I'm in it. And it's like no man, um, that that's not actually how it works, you know? Like because it's work to be and it's work to attain prayer, um, and. You know, if you're spending more Ooh, time, that's reading, big, Father. Can we dig into that, please? Yeah, I mean, if people spend, need to hear that one. If you're spending more time reading about prayer than praying, then you're missing out on everything because the actual work of prayer is where you begin to first experience yourself, and then, God willing, you're able to experience, you know, the Holy Spirit and 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 the life of Christ, you know, and that leads you to the Father. But that that work of prayer is arduous and it, and it takes time. There is no, well, there is one shortcut. <laughs> Let me take that back. There is one shortcut and people don't want that shortcut. Right. Um, but is that the that cross? Short, suffering. Yeah. Suffering. Yeah. Yeah. And just so we're clear, just so we're clear, suffering isn't going through pain or a hard time or having something happen to you that you don't like. That's not suffering. Everybody has things that they don't like. Everyone has pain. Very few suffer, meaning they patiently endure with the hopeful expectation, right? That's with the hopeful saying. expectation. That, that is really important. That's that's the that's the trick. You going through a hard because well, otherwise it could be despair, right? Otherwise yep. you, you could just be in depression yep. at that point. Yep, it doesn't doesn't mean anything. It doesn't it doesn't mean anything. In fact, it truly doesn't mean anything because that's where a lot of people fall into a, a deep nihilistic despair is pain um you know and i victor frankel can help you get to that a little bit you know? <laughs> but again victor frankel he stopped short because christ actually brings you know the truth to the the, the experience of suffering um, i i don't know if um i've mentioned this before but it was pretty profound at least for me um father peter hears had some kind of conference or something like that and one of the priests that was talking um on youtube i saw this on youtube was basically talking about people will suffer if it means not repenting like yeah. they will continue to suffer if it means that they don't have to repent and then like that's kind of what i have tried to kind of tell people without telling them directly it's like you know that one thing you really don't want to do mm -hmm. that's like the thing you got to do like that's that that one path that every time you look around at the different paths it's got like all gated off and there's like the wooden plank fence in front of or whatever like that's the path you got to head but what's down. crazy is what, what's what's crazy is i just i i my hope and my prayers that this will hit home with somebody just at least one person is that there is something on the other side yeah <laughs> there really i mean there's someone on the other side there really is and the problem is is you just I know it's tough, you know, but you're just, if, if you are feeling like there's just no hope or the next time you get to that space where you just can't get past how bad you feel, just think about your little kid brother or that kid you saw in the grocery store, like that kid that you saw that is just losing their mind. And like the whole time their mom's trying to hand them an ice cream cone with their mom's right there. You know what I mean? It's just like, man. You just need to pull out of yourself just a little bit and you'll see that it's really okay. You know, 
it really is okay. And and that's what's so hard is that, you know, when people get just in that, you know, the devils, they work so hard to get, to get us locked in on ourselves. Um, and, and really to cut us off from seeing Christ, because when you see Christ, it really doesn't matter what you're going through. I know people will be like, oh, okay, whatever. But I'm just telling you, when you really, there hasn't been a temptation. There hasn't been a trial or, or a struggle that I haven't seen personally or seen other people get through where when Christ is brought in, where it's like, oh man, you know what I mean? Like I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen like, I haven't seen Christ show up and it's still bad. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I just, I haven't seen it. Um, so, you know, but the problem is we, we forget it. We forget it, you know? And I know people are like, what are you talking about? It's like, man, if you look in your own life, those moments where you're just like, yeah, it's just, it's never going to get okay. And then what happens, right? You get through it. You're like, okay, you feel bad because God delivered you. And then guess what? Rinse and repeat. It's going to happen again in three weeks. You know what I mean? So how about, Instead of, you know, we keep banging our head against the wall thinking that, okay, this next time I do it, I'm going to turn into a, you know, unicorn. You're not going to turn into a unicorn. Like, not that way. You know what I mean? Let's just try something different. And that's the thing is Christ is always offering us that other option. And it's not even just the third option. It's the 15th option. Like, there's, sure. there's an infinite amount of creativity that christ brings into every and any situation but you have to invite him into it you know what i mean and i think that's the key father is the in the invitation yeah. right and the 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 preparation I was, I was, it's interesting because uh totally unexpectedly a longtime friend of mine who's actually been a uh since I've known him, I've known him a very long time, uh, probably maybe close to 15 years, but he's been a practicing. Now he's like a priest of like Ifa, like the, the, you know, kind of voodoo stuff oh. like Nigerian. And yeah. he just told me that this last weekend he went to an Orthodox church near him. Really? Yeah. He was like, I ate some bread. I kissed the priest's hand. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was like, really? Wow. Really? Wow. And, but we had a convert and he, and, you know, because he's coming from a, a ritual magic system, right? And so mm -hmm. I, I was like, oh, you're, believe me, you're going to get this. Mm -hmm. Like primed. this, you'll, yeah, you're prime for this. Like you, you will get this. But he was like, so now he said, so now I guess I'm just going to wait to see what happened. And I was like, well, it's not magic, like what you're used to with like charms and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and this is the conversation that we had was about invitation. Mm -hmm. And you know how you always say, and, and, and it's like, it's right there. Like God is not a rapist, mm -hmm. you That's know, right. that it's, that it's like, he's not going to force himself on you. That's not how it's. And it's like, if I, and I, and that's what I was telling him. I was like, look, when you go and you talk to these gods, these, these demons, right? Like yeah. who, which turned into like Papa Shango and all yeah. these kind of like crazy yeah. voodoo Papa ones, Shango. right? Don't, he's got the originals, you know what I mean? Oh, but it, it's like, when you go and talk to them and Legba and all of these, when you go and talk to them, you go with intention mm -hmm. to ask them for something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, were, were you there like asking for mercy and grace? Like when you right. were there or were you just like, well, we'll see if he'll push his way through. Right. Well, the other thing too is what you're asking for is something to reward you or something, your benefit. Right. And again, this gets back You're saying to with the, what, what he's been asking for, what yes. he's, Yes. Yeah. Okay. He hasn't been asking for. He hasn't been asking for actual wisdom, or, you know, love or humility. You may be asking for power and knowledge. Maybe asking for that hot babe to satisfy his desires. You know what I mean? Or to be uh, having a social status. But like, you know, I'm not saying him particular, but just anyone who's practicing, who's seeking help from these. Um, demons and deities and, and, and practices. I mean, and again, this is, gets us back to the, the slave, the son, the slave, the servant and the son. Right. I mean, a lot of Christians are like that, you know? Yeah. You know, you, you're used to coming to God. It's like, yeah, I'm Orthodox, whatever. And, you know, I pray when, you know, the tax man's coming cause I cheated on my taxes, you know, so I need help or, you know, my wife is mad at me because, you know, she caught me again 
you know, doing whatever. And so she's really mad this time. You know, we, you know, my kid is sick, you know, and we, we go to God and like, in, Hey man, you know, um, that's the vast majority of, of people is where they're at. And that's Israel. That's the story of Israel. You know what I mean? Um, but what's great is when you read, you know, Chronicles and Numbers and First and Second Kingdoms and everything, you start seeing that like it is possible to cut through, to break through, and to have a heart. You know, there's these kings. It's like like every, for every five kings, there's the one king who's like you know had their heart after God and followed after the ways of David, and you know that that's us. You know, we can be we can be that king who, although is flawed you know, repents and, and, you know, like Manasseh and just wants to, you know, Lord, give me more time, you know, give give me more time and God will grant you those years, um, you know, proverbially speaking, you know, if we ask of him with the right heart. Um, And I think, I think that's the big thing about understanding why, you know, getting back to delusion, why that begins to happen to people. Um, You know, someone who loves God doesn't fall in delusion. Saint Asitas fell in delusion because he, because of pride. He fell in delusion because, you know, he wanted to be an advanced monastic, mm. and that happens to monastics a lot. That happens to clergy a lot. That happens to Christians a lot. They, they want, they want to. There's something about identity, which is idolatry too, right? I want to be this fill in the blank, you know. But the person who's like, I just want to know God, they're not gonna fall into delusion. You know what I mean? The person who genuinely, authentically just wants to know God is not going to fall into delusion. Now, the person who's just like, I don't want to go to hell, you can fall into delusion because you're wanting something. The person who's like, you know, I just want my life to be put back together. You can fall into delusion because you're wanting something. But the person who just wants God and has fallen in love with God, you're not going to fall into delusion. You know, because you're not chasing after the thing and you're not going to fall into the Faustian deal which is super easy to fall into. Even if you're a Christian, you begin to, you know, God help you You begin to approach Christ the same way Faust did, you know? I mean, getting back into Faust and the illusion, like people, like if you know the story of Faust, like Faust was a theologian, right? (laughs) I mean, I don't know how many people know the story of Faust, but, you know, Faust was a theologian and, you know, knew God and basically gets into this, packed with Osmodeus because, you know, he basically, you know, kind of renounces God and is like, yeah, you know, I'm not really kind of down with this whole thing with you and, and you know, what you want from man. It's like, so you're not practical, you know, and Faust begins to move into this state of demonic delusion where, you know, even as he tries to break out of it more and more, it's like, even when he has these moments of trying to wake up, he can't because it's like, he gets lured back into his appetites and what that thing is, you know, whatever that appetite is, you know, Do that, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no, totally. It's, it's the, it's a cycle I play out all the time. Of I, And you know, when God does, when I do allow God to work the way that he works to go back to what you said earlier about the suffering and stuff, I always end up generally grateful because what I realize for is, the suffering you're saying grateful for the suffering. or not I'm never grateful for suffering but what I am grateful for is the end product of that suffering we'll work on that the, the fruit yeah the fruit we'll work no on that. I I I recognize suffering is a good thing and generally when I am suffering I take knowledge I take comfort and that like okay something is happening here something is happening here like okay this is good like you know, and, and sometimes, you know, if I'm being honest, then like I get irritated and stuff like that. I'm not going to try and act like I handle suffering any differently than I do, which is generally with, okay, I know something is going to happen. Like right now, if, okay. So like if my wife and I are struggling with financial difficulties or something like that, I'm like, okay, we're about to get not money, you know, and the guy's not, God's not gearing us up to win the lottery, But like something good is going to happen at the end of this. Like it might not be money, but it might be something else. Like something good is going to happen and not even like physically, like something spiritually good might come out of this. A greater trust in God, a greater understanding of what it means when I pull up next to a dude who has no money and no food and recognizing I'm not, not 
kind of in like not the same boat, but the same fleet of boats as you are. Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. I may be driving a car, but I have three dollars today to make it work for lunch. And so I'm going to have to go buy a loaf of bread and some peanut butter from Aldi. And that's that's that. And that will be my lunch. So I do understand I don't get to go have the deluxe combo meal from Chick-fil-A or whatever. But when I end up in a spot, when I realize this, usually for a while, I've been skidding on the surface because that's where the quote unquote good feelings are. And then once I start to go down, I recognize, oh, there's this huge depth to what's happening here. And I'm missing it all the time because I'm afraid to feel negative feelings. I'm afraid to feel bad. And it was just, just a couple of days ago, I was watching, um, I finally got to watch All Quiet on the Western Front that um netflix world war one movie and i mean anybody who thinks they got it bad just watch that movie for like you know like an hour or whatever if you can handle it and um just totally walking away from that experience the same way i always do when i watch movies of extreme suffering or read stories of extreme suffering i'm just like i just again i got no idea i got no idea what it actually means to suffer what it actually like actual pain looks like because I mean, I, I live a pretty cushy lifestyle. So, and it's very rare, though not all the time, but it's very rare for me to not get something I want. Like, generally speaking, I get the things I want. So, um, we all do. yeah, hunger I mean, hunger is hunger is good. Like, is. this is just something that I like. Starving is starving is not great, right? Being starving, starving is not great because when someone is starving, they'll make some pretty bad decisions. Sure. But like, you know, how, how, how do I stay hungry? This is something that I like am constantly, I I have to ask myself a lot less now because like, well, just follow the calendar, right? That it's like, sure. just, just sure. follow the calendar. Don't worry. You'll be hungry when you need to be hungry. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's something about that, that incarnational aspect of the hunger. You know what I mean? Like, And this is one thing that like attracted me in my 20s and 30s. And and I think why in some ways I became addicted to to bodybuilding, basically. Right. Was and like all natural, never took any. I was never into like the getting big or anything. No, no, no. None of none of that. But but the aspect of. You know, there's this uh, there's just this something about it pulls you out of the delusion. Like that's I guess the, that's yeah. what it is. It's the, it's the yeah. incarnational aspect of I'm hungry right now. Yeah. Everything gets into order. It's weird. Thing, Everything goes into order. Because the thing is, is when you're satiated, right? Um, it's like an intoxication. What happens when you're intoxicated? You don't feel anything. You know, the intoxication, you 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 get numbed out by the endorphins, you get numbed out by pleasure, and and you default end up not. That's why it's like comfortably numb. Right, like if you comfortably numb, numb. like forgive yes. me, forgive me. It's gonna scandalize some people. I know. I'm just, I'm just telling you. Like, if you've ever been on an opiate, like that's what it feels like. One hundred percent. That's that's. I mean, there's a reason why that's. I mean, that song is so profound because it's true. So if you if you know it, then you know it's true. And so that's the, that's the complete opposite of the ascetic life, and that's why there is no orthodoxy without the ascetic life. That's why the whole academic orthodoxy and the kind of like, I don't know, I don't know what to call it. I don't want to be too like pejorative or offensive, but just an orthodoxy without an ascetic life, it isn't Christianity. It isn't orthodoxy. Orthodamia? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Father, I, th- I think That's so kind of a nice people, way of putting it. Yeah. I think so many people can like, they conflate and again, like I'm, I, I feel so blessed that the Lord gave me like the, the ramp up to be ready, mm-hmm. like for this mm-hmm. piece in my life. But it's like the conflation of asceticism or this staying hungry or any of that. This con- a conflation of that with pain. But it's like masochism. it's something. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's something different than, and it's no. something different than pain. Like maybe it's discomfort, but it's a, even a different because it's. Because you willing, there's something about willingly entering into it beforehand and saying this is the this is where I'm pointed. That is something very different than like stubbing your toe. Yeah, you know, or the being guy, stabbed in the street. <laughs> well, or even like you know the guy who 
is so obsessed with looking a certain way that he'll do whatever it takes, whether it's, you know, using certain chemicals to the point where he can't have children, you know what I mean? Or doing certain things to where his like family suffers, whatever, just so that he can like look a certain way. Um, and that's all painful. It's all painful to work out, whatever. But like, you know, that that's, that's the difference. That's not it. Asceticism is the guy who's consistent and doing his, his little bit of workout, you know, he's healthy, but he's healthy so they can like be, you know, play ball with his kids and, you know, you know, be with his wife and just be present for his family and, you know, and like, and it gives him clarity of mind. You know what I mean? He's not all cloudy because of too much stuff. It's like, that's the difference. That's asceticism. And then the guy who's like, I just want to be intimidating because I'm, you know, um, it you know, would I'm, be, I'm dealing with my own inadequacies and so that leads me rage, to insecurity, rage, all insecurity. those guys, they'll talk I about rage. You know, I can't have kids. Yeah. That's the difference. Like that's not asceticism. Right. Um, and so it's the same thing. Like, you know, this is why in, in our tradition, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm saying it real clear. It's like, if you're, if you're Orthodox or you're approaching Orthodoxy and you're either a not engaging some level of asceticism in the right way, meaning with a blessing, meaning like it's balanced, then you're not really a Christian. You're not really orthodox. You're just you're a crane. You're a floating brain. That's that has nothing. That's not incarnational, right? The incarnational reality of orthodoxy, which is an ascetical reality, will give you the joy of fasting. It'll give you the joy of vigilance and 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 not being stupefied with with an abundance of sleep. You know what I mean? That's you know the ascetical life will actually help you to enjoy the things of life. Oh, yeah. That's the other thing is asceticism is not some sort of weird Western dour, like it isn't some Gnostic. It's not Gnosticism, which hates the flesh and hates incarnational reality. You know, that's not it. It's not pietism. <laughs> bringing everything into line so that you can like, I think I've told this story before, but one of the best days I've ever had was on that, like the day it was like bright Monday and like I was supposed to go to jury duty and they ended up not having it. And I just walked downtown Kansas city and the weather was like perfect. And like, I, cause that Lent had been intense and, um, I like, there's like a building downtown that has a park on top of it. And I sat up in that park and I brought comics with me and I just ended up not even reading them. Cause I just sat and looked for like a half hour and that's not like me to do something like that. Usually I gotta be doing something or something like that, you know, to distract myself or whatever. But that moment was just so like important because things had just been so rough. I was kind of like on the other side and like, I could hear a bird and I'd be like, wow, that bird's incredible. Like, wow, I haven't heard a bird in a while, you know, like, cause we've just been so bogged down or whatever. And yeah. it's, it's great. Like, you know, eating a cheeseburger sometime on Bright Week is like, wow, burgers are awesome. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, now that I'm not glutting on them every day of the week, you know, I'm not hitting up Wendy's every single day for lunch. Like, I, I really that's actually appreciate point. it. That's a great point because that's the other side. That's the temptation from the right for people with asceticism or anything. Asceticism is not the end. It's a means. And I yeah, And often was... people miss out on the fact that the means of it is to actually learn to be grateful and thankful, you know? Yeah, that's the, that's the, um, I see this in the manosphere, you used to brought up Liver King, but I see this like in the manosphere, like Jocko Willing, David Goggins and all of that. And you're like, I, I, and I've often thought, I've like looked at those individuals and said, well, you've just given up, like, what is, why does this a means, like, what's the end? Like, what is this a means to? Because it seems like what you're out to do is just to see to what degree you could punish yourself. Like yeah. David Goggins talking about running like ultra marathons on two broken feet and all of this. And it's like, yeah, but what's at the other end? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What's at the other end of this? It's there's no where's the appreciation? Well, here's the thing. David Goggins, he's not praying the prayer of St. Ephraim. No, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> yeah. Which, for those of you who don't know the prayer of St. Ephraim, it's 
the prayer that Orthodox Christians traditionally will pray at least once a day during Lent. Yeah. Um, and it speaks to this this very thing. So. The last thing I'll say on this is my own personal experience is that whole comfortably numb thing. There, there can be a point, like part of the the healing and i don't mean healing in like the worldly sense of like feeling better but like the um, the father seraphim rose uh definition of sobriety being seeing things as they are is there's like a sweetness to pain because when you go so long without feeling pain and avoiding pain that when you actually start to feel it again it's like man actually no this is good like this is this is actually not too bad like yeah no um, pain no gain right yeah i mean literally because the opposite is like not engaging with anything in a real meaningful way because well, that's where you can start getting people doing things like cutting um or they start doing other kind of like disordered behaviors but that's and, for the sake of pain right father like the they want pain, pain for pain's so, sake yeah but they're so numbed out and they're but, so numbed out because interestingly enough um well that's a whole other topic but people get so numbed out for various means various reasons um and that there's a longing to just feel anything huh. and so it's it's a little problematic that's know? rough but this is this is because they haven't i'm seeing this now i'm seeing this i'm seeing this unfold that like a a practice of asceticism is almost like it's almost like it's like cleaning. It's like you said it. It's cleaning the noose almost. Mm -hmm. Like it's like it is. No, not almost. It is the practice of asceticism is like re keeping on resetting yourself. Because mm -hmm. the thing is, the thing is, is that people when you start to like throwing around news and stuff like that, people remember this problem with conflating the spiritual with exclusively immaterial. The spiritual does not exclusively mean the immaterial. And so when you're talking about cleaning the news, it's not just an immaterial reality, right? It's incarnational. So that's why there is no real orthodoxy without asceticism. You're not going to enter into purification and thus illumination and thus theosis without asceticism. It's just not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen, which is one of the, it's one of the main reasons why we are so skeptical of scholasticism because scholasticism presents someone an idea that you can be saved just based on knowledge. But scholasticism is Gnosticism. Yes. Mm. Hey, literally, literally. Shocker. literally. I agree. Yeah. I, um, Oh, dang. Well, I'm just going to trust. I wasn't supposed to say that then. Cause I had an idea popping on my head and just as quickly popped right out. Um, uh, I think we're coming up on two hours. Pretty uh, close. Yeah, I think we are. So I didn't look for a question from the audience. So I will ask Father. Oh, Cyprian, do you have any questions for Father? Like any, like uh, maybe like something kind of out there? I'm trying to think if anybody's, if, if, if anybody's asked me something that I was like, oh, I need to... Um, Mm, well, maybe, maybe that, maybe this is something. Maybe this is something, Father. Um, you know, we've because this did come up. So, you know, we have talked on this show before that there have been, let's say, varying responses to things over the last three years by varying um, dioceses, archdioceses, hierarchs, sometimes at the parish level. Et cetera, et cetera. Some of those things were not necessarily things that I think the three of us and many other people would have agreed with that happened. Things happen. There have been people who have uh, asked me. It happened this week, but it's happened before. Um, they're looking around for parishes to go to. They've never been to an Orthodox service before. They're looking around for parishes to go to. And the this question kind of comes up that it's like, well, and a lot of these are people who live like far away from many parishes but they're like well i found one that's within an hour of me mm -hmm. um and it's like it'll be like greek or antiochian or maybe it's rocor or something like that right and they'll be like is this a good church for me to go to right and they're like because 
I, I've like listened to the Royal path or like I've heard other Orthodox say that there were some various different things that I just want to make sure this is a good church to go to what I've been telling these people. And, and I, I want you to, you know, say that maybe how I could improve this is I've basically been saying, like, I, I look, I'm like, this is an Orthodox church. Yes, it is. It is Eastern Orthodox. It's not Oriental. It's not any of those. I'm like, that's the church. Mm-hmm. If the choice is between you going to that service or you not going to that service, that's a good church. Yeah. 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 I mean, so it's just real important to recognize, you know, this isn't April of 2020. Right. So um, I would just say most people aren't going to encounter something that's going to be so egregious to not do that. Um, and if you do, I guess, you know, that's another conversation, but really, um, at this point in the game, just go. And what you'll find is if you go with just a humble heart, um, you know, I'm not saying not know your line, of course, know your lines, of course, all those things, but if you just go with a humble heart and just really wanting to seek God, and not just kind of like find the right camp to be in. That parish may not be where you end up, but it can be where you start. And that's that's really the key. It's just start, you know, because God will meet you where you're at if you're if you're authentically wanting to seek him. If you if you're actually wanting to seek him, then he will reveal himself to you. And um you know, we're not Protestants, we're not Congregationalists, you know, are some parishes, you know, do they have a greater experience than others? Sure, of course, you know, but that doesn't, but that's not saying that like the church, the the, the a certain parish isn't, you know, it's not like well, this, this parish is better than that. I mean, yes, that's true, but it's not at the same time, you know what I mean? Because you know, it's not contingent. The priesthood isn't contingent upon the the charismatic affect of the, of the man. You know what I mean? It can enhance it for sure. But there's a base level there, which is it's all God working, you know? And sometimes, I'll just tell you, you know, I'm just, you know, kind of just for fun, whatever. People, because they may watch the show, they may think like, oh, it'd be great to be at Father Turbo's Parish. Ah, maybe. Maybe it's all people love until I give them a hard word. Until I tell them, you know, it's like, heck, Cyprian, you're not here. And I've had to give you a hard word before, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, absolutely. You know what I mean? And you felt that like, ah, ah. I mean, that's. Yeah, it turned right? out for the absolute good. I'm, I'm thankful, like incredibly thankful for mm. it. But yeah, at the time. It's hard at the time. It's hard. it's hard at the moment, you know? And so, I mean, and I guess that's that's another great insight I like to give is that, um, you know, be careful about how you're measuring these things. Like, look, guys, this is about salvation. This is about salvation. It's about being returned to the, the purpose and the intent of what God wanted for us and for you as a person. That's what this is about. And... You're not going to get there by having God hand feed you bonbons. You know, you get there by, by being in love and that love, you know, works it out. And so I just want to encourage people with that because sometimes being in that parish, which isn't ideal is probably the best thing for you. And what you'll find is your circumstances. If you start to say, may be blessed, you know, whatever God has for me, I'm just going to trust you, God, and just talk to God about it. Um, guess what? God's going to answer you. That's the problem. That's that's what people don't want. They don't want, people don't actually want God to answer. You know what I mean? They they want to. It's scary, Father. I think it's scary for a lot of people because it's, it's well, because it's pointing at, it's pointing at the cross, right? Like mm-hmm. he's going to answer with the cross. Mm-hmm. I oh. think that's scary. I Okay, I just had two things to say. There was this last couple of weeks ago. Um, I I don't forget what happened. I think my wife had lost our wallet. So 
we didn't have any debit cards. We had nothing. I had like Apple Pay, and that's all I had with like to get food or whatever. And even then, like I was trying not to use it. And God is God is God, so it's this is good. But um, a buddy of mine walked in um, to uh, my office. And it's totally normal for him to bring me like snacks. Sometimes you'll get a pizza or whatever and be like, I can't finish this. You can have the rest of it. And he walked in with a bag and he was like, hey, I brought some snacks. I was like, oh, I was like, awesome. Okay, it's like 3.30. Still have another hour and I have to work. Just a couple snacks to kind of get me through the rest of the day, blah, blah, blah. And he pulled out a cross. <laughs> like he had found a cross at a that looked vaguely, you know, Eastern Orthodox, like vaguely Byzantium. And I was just like, oh, okay. Yep. Got it. Yeah, like that is that is very like just open up the bag and there's a cross. And I was like, yep, okay, that's fair. But that's fair. And I'm just gonna say this really quick. We have taken the opposite stance against this before on this show. And like it's okay. I understand, like we can grow as people, we can learn more, there's more to be revealed and everything like that. But we have said on the show before, so I think maybe what needs to be stated is like like that if a church is not like a such a great parish like in a sense of like maybe participating in some of the bad stuff that we talked about avoid I mean, don't give, well, uh, cool so stuff. so hold on hold on. Hold, on. Hold, on. Uh, hold on hold on let me just clarify something here like i just said this is in april 2020 right you had taken things have shifted a little bit but if it makes anyone come i can be really explicit you know i personally still if you walk into a place this is whatever, you know, and you see people doing odd practices with the chalice. I do, I would not go there. Right? That's what that's, I was going to say. What's the line? That, I'm not backing off on that at all. Sure. Right? No, but, I didn't think you were, which is why I would ask, yeah. what are the things to look out for then in that parish that would yeah, be problematic? I mean, that's, that's like the thing, you know what I mean? And I would say... You know, like if someone, if I had a spiritual son or daughter and they were like, found themselves, I would just say, you know what, do Tipica, do this and that. It'd be better to do that than just, and, and than, than to be there, you know, um, in that situation. But, you know, listen, if people ring, if, you know, if there's people out there wearing masks, whatever, it's like, ugh, okay, you know, it's like at this point, you know, it's like, you can endure here, here here's how i try to explain to people like it depends on everyone right uh for some people like if you're in a place where you're just you can't be in a, in a service because you just sit there and you're judging you know that weird person in the corner wearing a mask you got a problem yeah i agree you got, at this at this stage, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're past the outrage, we're past whatever. At this stage in the game, if like if you can't handle that, then I'm just telling you you're struggling with the temptation from the right, and you need to just kind of like get over yourself and really get your get your eye on Christ, right? Because your eye isn't on Christ, your eye is on ideology, your eye is on like being correct, being quote correct, unquote. all that stuff, right? There's a qualitative difference between someone defiling the Holy Eucharist and like, you know, a couple people or whatever, the people wearing a mask, you know what I mean? Like, hey, if you go there and they're like, you can't come in unless you wear a mask, then okay, God bless you. If you don't want to wear that, I support that. God bless you, whatever. But like, if no one's messing with you, just pray. Yeah. You know what I mean, just just pray. It's like, okay, person wearing the mask in the corner, who cares? Just pray. Right. That's that's what we're talking about, you know, sure. because God, God can meet God can and will meet you there. You know what I mean? There's a qualitative difference between those two things. So yeah. just to be clear, just to be clear. You know. Yeah. Those are the you walk in and just walk right back out type of things where it's with the defiling of the Eucharist. Yeah. You just walk in, walk back out. So, um, OK, so um, if you feel we are of course available for questions feel free to reach out in the comments or you can send something to andrew at royalpath.network i am all sorts of trying to get off very difficult or very much trying to get off of youtube as much as i can because it's a whole thing um so if you guys either you two see questions in the comments please 
bring him up. Um, and uh, you can also reach us at Andrew at Royal Path Network. That's my email. Send something to me and um, we'll, of course, answer it on the show if it's you know possible. Uh, I haven't updated it in a couple of weeks and I apologize for that because I just haven't really gone back through and listened to the episodes. But if we mention a song or a band or something like that, we try and stick it on a playlist on Spotify called um, Royal Path Playlist Podcast, something like that on Spotify. Um, and then um, we also have a store Orthodox or a Royal Path dot store. Uh, we don't see those proceeds. They either go to the parish or they, and then one third of it goes to the people who make the dude who makes the shirts or the merch or whatever. So sorry, Jack thumbnails. Is mm -hmm. that Jack? Jack, you're yeah. killing it. Thank you so yeah. much. I appreciate you so very, very much. Also, I think we'll put uh, a link in as well. There's a family. We talked about this last week. There's a family. Um, there's a car accident. A very pious, very lovely, wonderful, beautiful little family. Um, and, uh, there was a car accident. The father husband is, uh, been hurt, won't be able to work for a while. So, uh, there will be a donation page there for them. Um, more about that there on that page. Uh, father talked about it last week as well. Very lovely, lovely people. Um, I've had, I've only met them in passing, but they're wonderful. Um, and, um, other than that, again, Jack, I just got to say this one more time. You're killing it. You're absolutely killing it. All of these I thumbnails really have been awesome. Yeah, have been, been awesome. Been my favorite is still St. Anthony. That's still my favorite so far, but you know, I am definitely open to uh to be wrong or to favorite. change my mind. Um I was trying to think if there's anything else that we plug, but I think that's it. That's it. So thank you, gentlemen. Oh, Mount Tabor, Mount Tabor School. Yeah. Mount uh, Tabor School. If you wanna uh there's there's that's at the very bottom of the description. So it's in there. All these things are in the description. Yeah. Mount Please Tabor. Go check it out. Yes, it's uh if you um are looking to help us um help the next generation, Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor, Mount Tabor, Mount Tabor. So anyway, uh we okay, yeah, that's it. Uh thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye.